It's Saturday, October 29th, 2022, and you're listening to episode 603 of Fear the Boot, a show about tabletop role-playing games and a little bit more. Running time for this episode is 41 minutes. Welcome to Fear the Boot. My name is Dan. I'm Brodor. This is Wayne. And this is Julia. All right, Wayne, so you had a shout-out you wanted to give, and then we're going to roll into a topic. Yep, we've talked about the show Gaming with Gage a while in the past. Uh, used to be a lot of interviews, but he has relaunched it now as Gaming with Gage and Friends. His friends are a lot of people that you'll recognize. Myself, Chris Hussey, Dot from the AP. It's a lot of people that you already know from different podcasts, but we talk about gaming topics, kind of like we do here, except a lot shorter and a lot more segmented. I posted on that Discord, who do I have to blow to get on the I show? I know, I love to get on the show. And I was I was ignored, and so I don't know if I've offended Gage, or if he stopped doing interviews because I'm so good at it, <laughs> or what the deal is. You're but, above the quality of what... You know, maybe you asked, and he still hasn't passed a shaken test. <laughs> <and> so, <laughs> he's you know, still shaken. See, there was conversations about it, but you were out of town at the time you posted I, it. I know, I suck. And you it's never right. looked at his response. To I you. didn't because Discord didn't tell me to look. Uh, he, he is looking forward to having you back on again. All right, I'll go back and check. I was just being a jerk because I felt neglected and I love the sound of my own voice. <laughs> I want other people to love it too. Just yeah. tell him if, if he wants to have either of us on there, not to put us on together. Yeah, no, then it's going to be a train wreck. Oh, yeah, that'd like be the last idea. thing we just recorded. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Dan, you remember about a year and a half ago? I put a call out because I was looking for players for an online D&D campaign that was going to be far more narrative than combat. Yes, sir. I wrapped that campaign up about a week or so ago. So it lasted about a year and a half. Oh, my gosh. Well, it was every other week. Oh. And there was a lot of missed sessions because I got hospitalized and all. But oh, What's wrong with you? Why didn't you run the game from the hospital? Yeah. Bed? No, the past two years. Technology exists. The past two years have been great for everyone. <laughs> so anyway, I finally wrapped the campaign up and... The big finale was not a boss fight. There was action and things happening, and there were some roles, but my players basically played Parent Trap with two deities, and they had the deity's daughter, a newly minted god, used to bring them together and try to unite and end this war that was going on. And it was really shocking to me afterwards, was as I'm talking to the players about it, most of them had never had a campaign end without a big boss fight. They all seemed to love how it wrapped up and that they all had things they could do, that there was a lot of roles and they all had things that they had built up to, but that it wasn't a big boss fight. And that just surprised me that this was something they hadn't experienced. Yeah, I think there's a bit of conceptual or storytelling theft that has occurred accidentally or informally between two forms of entertainment, which is if you go way back in video game history, video games stole a lot of their concepts, particularly in the RPG genre, from tabletop role-playing games, the use of hit points and whatnot. I mean, gracious, a lot of the old early RPGs on computer were taken straight from D&D. They even had oftentimes tools where you could recreate your D&D character in this video game. Some of them actually yeah. were D&D games. Some of them were just plainly knocked off from it. It was like, either Wasteland or Fallout that was based on, like, GURPS. But then they redid it to create their own system. Yeah. And it was even rolling dice in the background. Yep. Exactly. It's rolling dice based on attributes and skills. And you have hit points and wound statuses and all this stuff. They all took straight from tabletop role-playing games. But then what happened is as people got more and more into video games, they began to emulate that storytelling style back into their role-playing games. And the way a lot of video games tell their story is there's a central theme where you face threats or obstacles of increasing importance and severity. You're escalating up and up and up until you eventually reach the central threat, right? The final mind behind it all and then you have a big boss fight to bring it all down. Yeah, and most of the time it doesn't even make sense for the final person to be a big fight. In like some situations where you're dealing with like a businessman or something, mm -hmm. when you get to that fight, why would this businessman be bigger 
and badder than his bodyguard that I had to fight to get to him. Yeah, exactly. Right. Great question for the Deus Ex series. <laughs> is why is some random corporate dude? Of course, the explanation is it's transhumanism and they could afford yeah. the most implants and so they're ultra dangerous. Final but Fantasy I, had this where like the president of Shinra is this huge big bad person you yeah. have to fight. When in reality they seem to just be a businessman until you go to fight them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I feel like the only time I've ever had that ha- this particular situation happen in my friends group is when I was playing Shadowrun. And I think that's probably because Shadowrun is usually about the planning of the run versus the actual killing of stuff. So it's like it, there was a fight, but not really. Like it was more like a break in and take. So maybe that's why it's like genre wise. Maybe people in D&D or World of Darkness where it's more adversarial. Yeah, certainly situations. D&D is a big one for that. Yeah. I think the level system in D&D also kind like of adds to that it, yeah. because you're getting more powerful. So the threats have to get more powerful. Yeah. And so the cycle of play becomes You're bigger, the monsters Mm -hmm. are bigger, you're bigger, the monsters are bigger. Repeat and repeat and repeat until eventually you get to the end of the game. And, well, now it just only makes sense that the climax of the game is the most powerful monster or the most powerful character. But that gets very, very boring. And I think that what's really interesting about what Wayne's talking about is that not only does it break the mold of what we're used to in the video game genre, it really does break the mold in terms of what we're used to in Dungeons and Dragons in particular. Yeah, they were dealing with deities, They're incredibly powerful, but it was their social interactions with them and the social capital they had built up throughout the entire campaign was what they pulled on to have everything turn out the way they wanted it. Were your players happy playing, I assume, 5th edition? Yeah. And not having a lot of fights? Yeah, a lot of, for a lot of them, they hadn't experienced that before. And that was kind of the point of it. You know, when I advertised the game, it was I was wanting to run a far more narrative one. Even so, there were surprises for them along the way. Why'd you choose D&D? Specifically because my wife had had a lot of horrible experiences with online D&D groups where they basically ended up being dungeon crawls. Got it. And mm-hmm. I knew that it could be more than that. And I wanted to show there is more potential even in running a D&D game. It doesn't have to be just a dungeon crawl. There is still plenty of opportunity for role play. And that was why I particularly picked D&D. I would not pick it again because it's not my comfort zone. It's not what I'm excited to run. I'm more excited to run other things. It was more, I was proving a point and providing something that was wanted for other people. So I was trying to give that. Yeah. I I don't know per se that I find the use of a boss fight as the climax of a story a problem. I mean, this is not something I would say to do this is bad form or bad, wrong fun. Yeah, no, a lot of cases that is exactly what you want. And I do that in yeah. many of my campaigns, build up to the point where they want to fight and they want to take out that bad guy because they hate him. Yeah, I think what I would try to emphasize here is that it does not have to be the end of the story, that the story, the conflict, whatever the problem is, It does not have to follow that formula. All I think I would put as really strong advice here, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some ways I've done this in the past or seen it done in the past, but the broader advice here, at least as far as I feel it should be, is not don't do this. It's don't feel like you have to do this. Or don't, when you sit down, write your campaign and be like, okay, here's the starting scene in the tavern. Here's the end boss. And that's already the path you're putting yourself on. I think a lot of it goes back to understanding the expectations you've set. I'm going to run a mystery game and they don't solve that mystery in the final session. Then you have let them their expectations. So from the beginning, I've wanted this to be a more narrative game. And that's what I talked about. So I did not set that expectation of it being a big final boss battle. Yeah, let's take one of the most popular fantasy stories in existence, Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Sauron was fought, or at least implied was fought, hand-to-hand, and had the ring cut off and all that stuff at the end of the Second Age, or I don't know, whenever that was. I'll admit I'm not a huge legendarium person or whatever. I know something about it. But when you look at Lord of the Rings, that does not end with a sword duel between Aragorn and Sauron. Mm-hmm. 
Quite frankly, it wasn't really badass if it did, but it, didn't. <laughs> it ends with a bunch of little short people throwing a ring. Well, one of them getting his finger bit off, yeah. and then another one falling into a. That movie ends with everybody going, why the hell didn't the Eagles drop it there in the first place? Well, That's how that movie ends. <laughs> okay. Well, the point being, that I look, Tolkien's dead. We can't ask him that. And I think, actually, he did somewhere address that, or maybe the son Christopher actually did explain why. I don't know the answer, but I, don't I do know, know it was addressed. Yeah. And there is a specific was, reason why they whatever could Whatever the case, whatever the case, the point is that that movie ends with, an army riding out to face the orcs of Mordor, and that battle doesn't occur. It doesn't happen. They they have a standoff and some skirmishes, at least in the books, is around these two rubble piles in the movie. It was one encirclement. But then as soon as two hobbits and Gollum, who was, what, a river person or whatever he was called originally, one of them bites the finger off the other, and they fall into the volcano and take the ring with them, and Sauron just dissolves. His spirit disappears or dissipates or whatever the orcs lose that controlling influence that kept them unified and then they go back and they just fall apart and flee to the four winds where they're hunted down and pared down until they're a manageable population that battle doesn't even fully occur much less a singular boss fight between gandalf or aragorn and sauron or something you know the closest you get to that is a fight with the witch king or whatever the head of the the nazgul but even that's not exactly a boss fight. Uh, another example, Star Trek IV. Mm. Star Trek IV ends with them crashing a ship into the ocean and suddenly two humpback whales free. Woohoo, my favorite. Yeah, it, yeah. there was no... My favorite Star there Trek. was really no particular antagonist nah. in the movie. I mean, there were a series of obstacles, but it, there wasn't even a big bad to defeat. And the thing they were ultimately trying to stop was a probe that didn't even understand it was creating those problems. Star Trek The Motion Picture did not end with a boss fight between the Enterprise and V'ger. It ended with the Enterprise crew simply understanding what V'ger was, in a way empathizing with it, and helping it to mature to the point that it could make moral decisions, that it could answer what were really metaphysical questions about why, and leave. Just go away. You know, go somewhere else. I don't know why it never shows back up to protect Earth from the board or something, but whatever. <laughs> That's a why didn't the Eagles fly him question. Yeah. But, you know, the, the point now, okay, you also then, I will admit, you get other movies. I'll stick with Star Trek here. Wrath of Khan did end with a boss fight. Star Trek Six did end with a boss fight. Hmm. You know, so, so it's like those were the never mind. Go ahead. I <laughs> love Wrath of Khan. I like Wrath of Khan, yeah. but and almost all the other uh, even numbered, even number ones. Really? That, yeah. I like Star Trek six. I thought six was better than two. I'm in the minority there. I like both two and six. I also like three a lot. I think three doesn't get enough love, but different story for so a different the one time. Dies. No, that's that's a number two. two. Three is oh, where he comes yeah. back. Okay. Right. Let me talk about how I've done this in a role playing game. All right. Now I'm going to use the D and D story as well. It's going to be a bit of a gaming story, so I, I apologize for that in advance. But to explain the ending, I think it's necessary to explain how I got there. All right, there's a campaign that I've run, I've mentioned before, usually under just the simple explanation that I had a game where my players talk the big bad out of his plan. Let me explain that campaign in a little more detail. The setup of it was I took some of the early drafts of Forgotten Realms when it was not very well detailed and there were a lot of things left up to reader interpretation. And there were several things that were kind of implied, but were never said. And I decided to fill in those things with my own assumptions and kind of flavor Forgotten Realms to my taste. And one of the things that was implied was that Forgotten Realms was actually something of a parallel dimension in some way to Earth. Okay, that the two had some commonality on some metaphysical level. The second thing that was implied about it was that the Forgotten Realms was encased in a web of magic that allowed magic to work, but that web itself was a construct. And there were things that were over and above that construct. Later, that got described in the concept of Ao, who was the god of the gods. And it's kind of implied that Ao may have had a tier above him. That somewhere up the chain may be a single monotheistic capital G God that just kind of 
parses out power a lot like what the single god over uh, Lord of the Rings does, where below the god there's this, and then there's the valor, and then there's this. And blah, I don't remember all the layers, but there's all these different layers kind of coming down. And so I decided to run the game, and the the hidden plot they were discovering is that they come to find out that, one, there is a form of magic that supersedes the web of magic. So there's a form of magic that is more pure and more real. It would be like the deep magic that created the web of magic in the first place. And that, secondly, humans appearing on the scene rather abruptly, because that is what happens in the History of Forgotten Realms, occurred, think kind of Witcher, because there was an alignment between two worlds, where a bunch of humans from Earth ended up in Forgotten Realms, and they took over and spread from there and became the dominant species. That I, I Once again, I know they changed some of this in later canon, but at least where I was reading from, this had not yet been hashed out. And so the end of the game, or the point of the game, was the guy that appears to be the big bad. One, he has learned the secret to that over magic, the real magic, okay, the deep magic, the old magic. He's figured it out. Well, specifically, he actually has a brother who's figured it out. And what he does upon learning this real history is he's like, these gods that are here should have no authority over us because we don't belong here. And he really wanted to understand or fix that intermittent rift or that intermittent alignment between Faerun and Earth. Now, he didn't know a lot about Earth. He just knew enough to know that there was a point where humans came from somewhere else. And so he and his brother do all this stuff. They gather all these artifacts, search out all these long-lost sites, and they recreate as much as they can understand about the history of all of this. And they find a spot that has been hidden, like behind magic, but once again, because they've learned this old magic, they can cut through that, where the humans first arrived at this place and built their first settlement and all out of this old history is still known. And they realize that another one of these planar alignments is about to occur. And what this guy was going to try and do is basically tear down the order of deities over the forgotten realms. And he knew enough magic and whatnot and artifacts to know how to defeat them and try and return humanity in particular back to Earth and back to what it should be. But they sit down with him, the players, throughout the course of the campaign because he starts off as a friend. And as he's supposed to become an enemy, they eventually learn enough of his motivations. They talk him out of that plan. And he agrees to a somewhat more peaceful solution that maybe the answer here is humans need to be respected a bit more by than the gods. I just ignore the time of trouble, so forget that bit of the history. But the humans need to respect it a bit more by the gods, but more than that, he just wants to close the rift. And so at the end of the campaign, they're back at this spot where the conjunction occurs, okay? This is the point in land that is closest to the planar conjunction. He goes through into this point where he's like in the astral plane or the ether or whatever between Faerun and Earth as they pass by each other on some metaphysical level. And I talk about how from where he is at, that he can look down and see Earth, and he sees it covered in what looks like a spider web of silk of these glowing lights. It was actually seen as modern society, but they don't, you know, they're medieval. They don't recognize what they're seeing. But he has seen all the lights of modern-day 20th or 21st century Earth and sees, you know, all of that technology, though it's from afar, so he doesn't understand what he's seen. And at this point has gathered what he needs to keep that door closed. But to do so, he has to stay there. And so they go through all this stuff to convince him to not do what he was going to do originally, change up the order of the gods, and actually one or two of the players end up ascending to fill some of the slots that were open there, where a god got killed, they become a god over that domain or whatever, and Ao actually dies and is replaced by a little girl that they had with them that they didn't realize was actually Ao's daughter. Wow. Uh, she was this little girl that was with them throughout the entire campaign that they just thought was a regular little girl. It was actually Ao hiding his daughter as a 
human child. And so she ascends to become the new over God. And the guy that was going to be the big bad just bids them farewell and says, I know I'm stuck here for eternity between Faerun and Earth, but that means the door stays closed. And he says, I'm okay with that. And he just sits down by himself, you know, looking down at all these bright lights of Earth. And as the conjunction is coming apart, the players, of course, have to return to Faerun. Mm -hmm. And so they go back to the Forgotten Realms, and that's where the campaign ends. There's no fight. You know, there was conflict on the way there, but there was no big fight. There was no big brawl. There was no 40-hit-die monster. That's how the game ends, with a guy basically bidding a tearful farewell of, I'm stuck here forever, but I have accepted this fate. Then the players have an epilogue where they either go their separate ways and go on to start new orders or whatever they're going to do, or like I said, one or two of them actually ascend to become gods themselves over this revised order of things. And the realm is forever changed. Once again, no boss fight. Is that how, I'm sorry, because there's a lot to unpack there. So I guess my question would be, when you did your epilogue, yeah. And I'm assuming it was just a short, you know, everybody gets a few minutes of spotlight when things are wrapped up. But the main story arc is this individual saying, OK, I'm just going to have a seat and rest out eternity and keep the two separated. Yes. Because I've done something similar, but I don't know what Wayne's was like. Did you do an epilogue? Oh, definitely. Or? So after they'd wrapped everything up, had the conversation, the gods that then had gone away and basically they've spent time to go for the next hundred years or so to get to know their new daughter and they banned all gods from stepping foot on the planet except for her and she has to come back once a year for one of the festivals that they would created around her but then i did for each player a little bit of an epilogue talking to them what their player want to do but they each got a boon from the gods yeah something customized to each one of them if I was going around the table here, I'd be like, okay, Broder, your character, here's what you found over the next couple weeks. And that would have been your boon. And now what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Mm. And so I brought them in and let them actually have a big part of their epilogue. Which I've done something similar, but obviously you've already answered this question. But Dan, were the people that you gamed with in that particular campaign... Were they satisfied with the resolution of things? Were they more satisfied that they persuaded him? Yes, because of the fact that I've described the story, but not the process. The process of how I got there was the players had a variety of people they could befriend, people they could turn into enemies, much like the Skies of Glass campaign. They chose the path toward the end. They could have chosen to say, no, this guy that's trying to plug the hole and tear down the order of gods or whatever is wrong, we're going to kill him. They could have said, he's totally right, we're going to join him. They could have said, well, instead of joining him, we're going to try and align with one of the existing gods because several of the gods courted them to say, hey, we know enough about the prophecies of what's coming that we know you yourselves may not be powerful, but you get to make decisions. You are a nexus point of fate. To have you on our side, even if you yourself aren't all that powerful, you know, you're the snowflake that decides which way the avalanche is going to go. Um, and so several gods try to cut deals with them. There's actually one point in the campaign where they had a TPK and Umberly, who they call the bitch queen. That's actually oh, her oh, name. Oh, oh, yeah. She brings them back from the dead and says, I'm going to resurrect you. But in order for this to go through, you have to swear to me that when this all falls down, you will let me live. And they were like. This is a god. They had no idea what she was even referring to. Like, we are no threat to you. Right. But they're like, okay, I guess we can go along with that. And so they picked all of this. Even at the very end, there was an outsider power, this kind of Lovecraftian power, that while Ao was weakening and Ao was hiding his daughter to keep her from getting killed before she ascended, there was this outside power. I think he was called like the Grey Lord or something like that who wanted to come in from the outside, knock Ao off his perch, and take over as the overgod. They could have aligned with the Grey Lord. They chose not to do that. Uh, you know, it was not like I scripted them into this ending. It could have ended with a boss fight. It could have ended with them having a boss fight 
against this ascendant human guy, against one or more of the gods, against the Grey Lord, you know, who knows what. It could have ended with them trying to go to Earth. Now, I would have ended the game there. I'm not going to do D&D on Earth, but they <laughs> could have not? done it. It could have ended with them saying, you know what, we're going to do something I hadn't even predicted. They chose how the end game was going to end, right? The epilogue was narrated based on their choices, but this was not what I wrote. It was just a possibility I allowed, and they earned it. They built it, and it was what they picked. Yeah, in my game, probably four sessions before, they went to go fight who they thought was the big bad, and they decided to talk first. And at that point, once they talked to him, they found out things and discovered more threads of the world. And it went from what was going to be a big fight, because I would have given them that. If that's the direction they would have chose to go was have that fight there, I was ready to do that. And that would have been the end of the campaign, whether they won or lost. But once they had more information, that's when they decided we're going to parent trap them. Mm -hmm. I've done this. I don't know. I mean, through the course of my career, but a few times, right? Mm -hmm. The only one that really I remember working because, you know, you've had so many games that just yeah. fizzle, right? right? There's not a lot of them in my career that I can look back at and say, you know, we ran this to the very end end. But similar to what you did with the D&D game, and this was I remember because I talked about it on this very show. And there were some audience members that were like, hey, maybe, Brodor, you should play a different game if you're not fighting that often in D&D, to which I was like, Rrr. but anyway, they didn't have a big bad fight, but there was a big battle and it forced all of the players to go back to across the ocean to the capital city of their kingdom, at which point they're received as heroes. And so what I did, even though there was a big fight, there was no big bad. It was a mass battle thing. They defend their outpost, yada, yada. They go home to be heroes. And then they discover all of these things that are happening at home. They're moderately high level, you know, 14th level D&D characters. They're starting to get position and accolades and title. And then obviously it's set up, even though everyone knows we're ending the game. I did it in a way that if we wanted to go back to that campaign and play those same characters, we could. If we wanted to fast forward 50 years and start new characters in that world, we could. But I liked the idea of ending it in a different fashion because it provided me the opportunity to revisit it. But I've never done what you're describing in terms of I'm going to walk away from this thing. I'm not going to come back to it. And have a nice non-boss fight you know, I, sort ending. of thing. Yeah, I think a way that I would look at this that maybe doesn't get rid of the boss fight. But once again, that's not my goal. I don't right. think boss fights are bad. I just think they should not be the only answer. But I think one of the ways to start seeing that there are other possibilities is when I run a game, I have a story. Right. And that may be what the characters are doing or participating in. But ultimately, my games are not about my story. They are about the story of the characters. It's about their lives, their choices, what they do. My story simply gives them something to interact with. See, so they're not sitting there bored. I didn't game master that way until my 40s. Yeah. And, and that's fine. And you don't ever have to game master that way at all. This no, is just my the, stock. No, I think it's for me as a middle-aged man, the right way to go. But, but I, I mean, I think I could defend why I think it's the best choice, but it is still opinion, right? And when you look at it that way, the game ends when the characters have resolved their path to their satisfaction. You know, when they feel like the things they needed to explore the places they needed to go, the ways they needed to grow or be challenged have occurred, the story's over. Now, you want to, of course, have some kind of satisfactory end of the narrative. Right. You don't want to leave the narrative dangling of, oh, yeah, Sauron is still out there and, by the way, has been completely unfazed by any of this. The ring just changed hands. Yeah, lame. I mean, yeah, exactly. That doesn't really answer the central questions the story raised, but that doesn't mean that you have to think of the whole game in terms of your story. I mean, the way I write my games is the story that I'm telling from start to finish 
is what would happen if the characters didn't exist. But now the characters exist, and they are going to knock this off balance. They are going to be the factor I haven't calculated. That I know what this faction wants, and this faction wants, and this faction wants, and this faction wants. And at these particular battles, this is who's probably going to win. You know, And this is how it would play out if the characters didn't exist. But they do exist, and they do matter, and that's the unresolved variable. You know, that's what's going to imbalance this equation to the point that I don't know where it ends anymore. Right. I've gotten into the habit. I'm sorry, Wayne, I'm I'm tangenting on your topic, but I don't even really think about my ending anymore. At this point, at least what I've been experimenting with in my current game is when I used to do debate in high school, I'd use a legal pad, right? And you would just have these columns and be like, okay, here's the first affirmative speech. This is what they said. Here's the first negative speech. And you kind of draw lines and you have a flow, a flow chart of the all of the arguments in the debate. Mm-hmm. So what I do now with my game mastering, and this is something I started after I did that last game notes, is I've got my legal pad and I literally just have columns from my PCs. You know, I've got Merrick and Reggie and Brock and Betty, and Lawrence. And then what I do is I just make notes under each of them. Instead of worrying about what my NPCs are doing or what's going on, in my mind, for what how I want to drive the story, I'm literally just paying 90% of the focus is on them and what they're doing. And, you know, it's been a little bit bumpy because, you know, I've conditioned my players to, I don't allow dysfunction. (laughs) And so now that I'm allowing dysfunction, we hit some roadblocks. But the point is, is that, yeah, I want to do more of that. I'm so... How I typically come up with my campaigns, I first go through character creation with the players. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Then I build the campaign around the characters that they have created. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same mm-hmm. here. I and might have I a few loose plan, concepts, but yeah. I don't plan the ending. I give them the complications. I plan what the bad guys are doing, yep. what's going on in the world. I don't have a solution worked out. It's not my job to create the solution. It's their, their job. job. Yeah. That's probably why. Like, It's my job to let them have that solution when they come up with a good one. It's probably why I don't GM very much. I, yeah, I'd be like Brodor except 10 times worse. <laughs> like, I have, like, my plans and I, they need to go well, the way they I, need to go. I have my control issues. And, you know, I mean, it's no, yeah. it's nothing new to the people that listen to this show. It's certainly not new to you guys. But if I'm doing most of the work, then I'm taking home most of the money. That's just the way it works. I kind of got the impression from a lot of my players that what they're used to is they go into a situation, they try to talk their way through it, but then it gets to rolling an issue. Yeah, exactly. Oh. So they they had those situations throughout the campaign. They roll into the situation, they try to talk first, they're expecting there to be initiative, and it doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, I've had several And the conversations keep happening, and they find ways without the fights. Mm. There were plenty of fights throughout as well, but the idea that they didn't have to was something that I wanted to see early in the campaign mm. where they found these seemingly big bad things that they could talk to. Yeah, I feel like I've had that happen more in my campaigns than maybe not the final boss fight, but several fights got avoided. Mm. Several. Yeah, and we got which, rewarded for it too. Yeah, because you've got to be yeah. able to. I mean, hell, in my, in my current Call of Cthulhu college game, I mean, they know who the villain is. They take class with him three times a week. They're in his class three times a week and there's nothing that they can do about it because there's no proof. There's no yep. nothing. And so they still have to go and listen to his bullshit. But now what's beautiful is that two of the people in the party were like, Hey, this professor is really smart and very capable and very in the know. Maybe we should start utilizing him as a resource. Maybe he's not the villain. So now there's just tension inside the group yeah. and, and no one had to throw a punch. Nobody had to draw a knife. It's just a difference I, of perspective and opinion. Oh, I think beautiful. Wayne did hit on something really important there as a side comment, which is you have to be prepared to accept and entertain their solutions. Mm-hmm. Then yeah. I think actually both of you two also mentioned the same thing, at least in passing when the black dragon lands, is it even allowed you know, will the game master even say, you're going to talk to it? Okay, sell me. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. is that even a thing? Mm-hmm. And if you're not going to be open to that as a game master, then yeah, your game is very scripted. It's not their story. It's yours. Mm-hmm. Once again, I'm not going to tell you it's bad, wrong, fun, but I will say I think it's a bit limiting. There were things they ran into in my campaign that they couldn't talk to. 
There were zombies and skeletons. Yeah, for they sure. are mindless. So, things the forces of going, nature. You can't right. negotiate with a hurricane. But if the thing that they were dealing with had intelligence, I was open to them talking to it. Yeah, it's the same thing. I recently was in my family D and D game that we've been doing on the weekends, the West Marches game. They had a run in. I'm using Forgotten Realms deities in this game, even though it's not set in the Forgotten Realms. So the Elemental Lord of Fire is Kosuth. Kosuth is fairly apathetic, but under him is a elemental prince or something by the name of, I think it's Imix, I think is his name. And he's a lot more ambitious, whereas most elementals are pretty neutral. This guy's not. He has a lot more ambition and a lot more zeal, and he's kind of a dick. And you can Google him if you really care. I think it's spelled I-M-E-X. They encountered him attacking a village. Long story, I won't get into of why he was there. And he was on a rampage and was basically trying to kill all the party members. Well, one of the guys that was playing a rogue who had just joined the game basically said, I, as I'm walking towards him, I'm going to just set my cloak on fire. And I'm like, okay, roll deception. I don't remember what he rolled, but it was amazing. Okay, he rolled really flipping high. So I gave him some kind of intelligence check, or I don't remember what it was, but I gave him some kind of check, and he didn't roll that well. And I said, Imix thinks you're one of his cultists. And so he calls you to his side, and I said, you notice your cloak is neither burning out, but it's also not burning you. It is just now forever on fire, mm -hmm. because Imix is basically giving you a, a blessing of sorts to mark you, because he thinks you're one of his cultists. He thinks you're one of his henchmen. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I'm going to give it to you. It's and as a result, Imix didn't attack him. Mm -hmm. Imix invited him to come over and to walk with him as he went on his rampage. And then he backstabs Imix. It is a longer story, but that's basically how it works. Is, yeah, that. they eventually walk Imix into a uh, trap where they had found a way to temporarily create a portal to the elemental plane of water and <laughs> oh. just douse his ass, put wow. him out. So, yeah, he died, but Imix died. That is not the character, but it's like. I had to give that to him. Yeah. You know, if I'm not going to even allow him the role yeah. or allow him, I didn't expect him to do it. I never thought his solution to the situation is I'm going to set myself on fire. I thought not getting on fire was the objective here, but I'm like, <laughs> try not to wake up on fire. Let's see where this goes. <laughs> like, what have you got in mind here? You know, if, if you're not open to being surprised, well, don't be surprised. You're not surprised. Right. Yeah, I mean, exactly that. If you're not open for the players to participate in the game, then why are you running? Yeah, even game? to change your I game mean, a even, little bit. Even a, even a militant, iron-handed dictator of a game master like I am, I recognize that, you know, I'm only one of several people at the table who are trying to have fun. And it's just like management on any other level. I don't want to discourage my employee from coming to me with ideas because this one was dumb. Yeah. You know, because then if I'm if if I crap on them for this idea, they're far less likely to come back to me in the future with it. Yeah, and I and I don't think you should reward every bad idea. No. But I think there are times you've got to say, you know what, for the sake of the story and the sake of the overall enjoyment, it would be better to let something kind of shady slide than it would be to shut it down and to, by extension shut down my players from attempting to participate because they feel discouraged. Now, I'm not saying there should be no boundaries. The players have an idea and it doesn't work. That's part of the fun. It just has to be out there that it could have worked. Or if not that idea, then a different idea. Yeah, like uh, in my in my uh, Cthulhu game, their friend was going to get nominated for a homecoming king as part of a prank because he's from Innsmouth. And so he has the Innsmouth look, even though he's a very sweet, nice guy. Is it, imagine if Abe Sapien were ugly. Like that was sort of my motive for this character. Anyway, they have this whole adventure where they have to break into the student center to change the ballots, right? So they change who are the, the uh, not the ballot, but, you know, the envelope, like for the Oscars or whatever. Yeah. They sneak in and they change that so they have orchestrated it that someone else wins so that their friend is not subject of this Carrie-esque, uh, you know, prank, right? And, you know, silly adventures like that, dude, it's been so much fun. Yeah. So much more fun than just going and Attacking killing said stuff. monster. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Cool. I think that's where we're going to go ahead and end this one. Uh, once again, check the show notes for a link 
to Gaming with Gage and Friends. And Friends. So Gaming with Gage and Friends. Take a listen to what's going over there as much as we make fun of him. Gage is a really good guy. And obviously, I really like his selection of guest hosts. Uh, They're so good, I should put them on my show. So, other than that, have a great week and great games, and we will catch you next time. This has been a production of Fear the Boot, copyright 2022. Listeners are free to use this episode in a non-commercial endeavor, so long as credit is provided to feartheboot.com. You can find previous episodes and other resources at feartheboot.com. If you wish to support this show and its related endeavors, you can do so at patreon.com slash feartheboot.